Director Halley. What page so people can follow up? Oh, 93. My next appointment was a familiar address, a neat California ranch style house about three blocks from mine. Hal, I'm so glad they sent you. Brooke Atkinson came running down the front walk as soon as she saw me pull up. Elliot and Luca, aged eight and four respectively, waved to me enthusiastically from the large bay window. I waved back, happy to see them. I not only exterminate tiny creatures, I babysit them. <laughs> What's up, I asked Brooke, searching through a pile of stuff on the passenger seat for my phone. Coming up empty, I tried to remember what Autumn had written in the notes. You had someone come out and set some traps or something? Brooke scowled. No, Mike thought he could do it himself. She motioned for me to follow and led around the side of the house. We've got gophers tearing up the back lawn, and we just had new turf installed. But the kids thought they were fuzzy and cute, so Mike went to Home Depot and bought one of those have a heart traps. And now we've got this. She flung her arm out in the universal gesture for, can you believe this crap? My gaze followed the trajectory to a metal trap on the far side of the yard. My neighborhood, known to locals as the Mesa, is an interesting ecosystem. Despite its long stretch of beach and generous parklands, the Mesa's dense human population has a limiting effect on wildlife. In other parts of town, you might see coyotes, bobcats, even the occasional mountain lion. The Mesa has to settle for gophers, seagulls the size of German shepherds, and of course, our neighborhood's apex predator, the skunk. <laughs> oh, that's a skunk, I said in a brilliant display of professional expertise. Uh-huh, Brooke agreed. Did you call animal control, I asked. They said they don't do skunks. Damn them. <laughs> Maybe you could take it to the park for me and let it go, Brooke suggested. I stared help helplessly at the skunk as it waddled in tight little circles inside the trap. It's illegal to relocate wild animals in California. Once you trap them, you have to euthanize them. Brooke gave me a horrified look. You mean kill it? That's horrible. Why would you kill a skunk? Why would you trap a skunk, I countered. <laughs> Oh my God, you can't kill it, she exclaimed. The boys would have nightmares forever. I'm not going to kill it, I told her. Most in this field grow desensitized to a certain amount of vermin death, but as I see it, the up close and personal assassination of medium sized mammals is not in my job description. How about you just keep the kids and the dog inside until Mike gets home, then make him let it out. He's out of town on business, she informed me, for the rest of the week. Perfect. I considered calling my dad, but I knew he would haul it off and kill it. Come on, Brooke prodded. Can't you just go over there and release it? I'm really not supposed to do that, I explained. It's not just illegal. Skunks can carry rabies and stuff. Hal, please, Brooke begged. I'm here by myself, and I'll never hear the end of it if I let you take it away and murder it. I looked at the skunk. It was very fluffy and seemed surprisingly calm. I wasn't fooled. Skunks can spray up to 20 feet. <laughs> Brooke sensed victory. Hell, you're the best. You are totally saving my butt here. I owe you big time. I'm going to make you brownies. I'd settled for an old blanket, I told her. Brooke led me to the garage where she was pretty sure there was a padded furniture blanket left over from their move. She spotted it folded neatly on a shelf along the back wall, and we began shifting plastic ride-on toys out of the way. As I rolled a cozy coop to one side, my ears caught the distinctive sound of dog toenails on concrete. Is the dog out? I asked. Brooke listened for a moment, then cursed. Riley, here, Riley, she called, treat. She frantically waded back through the toy jungle, but I was closer. I leapt over a battery powered Batman Jeep and sprinted into the yard, colliding with the eager Springer Spaniel as he barreled toward his promised cookie. I reached down and grabbed him by the collar, got him. Brooke emerged and took over my hold on the dog. I told the boys to keep him inside. What were they think? She gasped. Luca, Luca freeze. I spun around and spotted the back of Luca's Paw Patrol t-shirt as he bounced across the yard, headed straight for the skunk. <laughs> Four-year-olds are ridiculously fast. They have very short legs, but maybe due to their smaller mass, they seem less affected by gravity than full-sized people. <laughs> this being the case, I must have been moving like one of those turbocharged zombies from World War Z because I somehow caught him before he reached the skunk. I scooped him up into my arms and took a flailing elbow to the cheekbone for my trouble. No, Luca shrieked, writhing like a caterpillar on meth. I'm gonna let him go, don't hurt him. I didn't argue as my primary concern was getting out of range. The skunk stared at us with dark, interested eyes, which somewhat reassured me. At least the end with eyes in it was the one pointing our way. 
Luca screeched again and the skunk twitched nervously. I started to lose my grip on his legs. Sensing an opening, Luca scrunched up as tight as he could, then gave a desperate heave. Even still, I'd have kept my hold on him had he not somehow managed to jam one bony knee into my diaphragm. I dropped the kid and fell to my knees, unable to breathe. Luca regarded me with a wide-eyed, uh-oh expression for a long second, then bolted for the house. My chest was a giant knot of spasm. I couldn't even gasp. Desperate to breathe, I flopped onto my back, and that, not the barking dog or the yelling, thrashing little boy, but me, lying helplessly in the grass, that was the last straw as far as the skunk was concerned. His funny little haunches swiveled toward me. I shut my eyes. Yeah. You'll have to read the book to find out what happens. I have to ask, it sounds like you had a lot of fun writing this book. Was it a lot it of was, fun? It was a lot of fun, yeah. Was there anything that surprised you about this whole process? Um... I think the surprising part with me was how everything sort of came together in the end. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little worried about that, mm -hmm. but it did. It worked. I finished the book. There, there's an ending. <laughs> <laughs> what were like the biggest challenges for you then? Just time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, when I originally came up with the idea and was discussing it with friends, Chipper, my youngest, was mm -hmm. really small and, you know, She's irascible sometimes, so, you know, just finding someone to hold her while I worked on things, and, you know, it was, um, that was, that was challenging. Just, her sis her just, sister has to agree. <laughs> Caroline has to agree. <laughs> Can't she be that way? Yeah. Um, when did you realize, though, that you, find, you had something, that it's all coming together? You know, what was that feeling like for you? It felt great. Um, it, I think the most important thing to me was that in the end, the poem that I wanted to include fit organically and seemed mm -hmm. to make sense to the story. And when I was looking to get it published, the most important thing to me was finding a publisher who would let me keep the poem in there. Uh -huh. And um, I think when I found that fit, that was just the best part for me was you know, finding yeah. someone who appreciated the book the way it was written mm -hmm. um, or contrived, <laughs> if you yeah. will, and, um, and, and making sure that it, it's the book I wanted it to be. That poem is quite good, too, I have to say. This being Poetry Month, uh, the poetry also includes Robert Service, the poet. And I was wondering if you could just share how did Robert Service and his poetry come into play? in this whole story it's just it's it's such a random thing for <laughs> it, it, it is um robert service is one of my favorite poets mm -hmm. maybe my very favorite poet and uh when patrick and i were discussing this new york times article that mm -hmm. came out about guano mining in the south pacific and right. i made a robert w service joke about that being like <laughs> gold mining in the yukon mm -hmm. and the next thing i know he turned out this amazing Robert W. Service parody um, oh, man. about the guano miners. <laughs> and I mean, structurally, it's exactly the shooting of Dan McGrew. It's really wow. quite amazing. That's genius to be able to do that. He, he's a genius. So. What I like a lot about your book, amongst the many things I like, are the characters. And I got to ask, are your characters any of them based on anybody in this room? <laughs> um, <laughs> or anybody that we know of or you know of? Uh, this gentleman back here uh, <laughs> is, is married to um, the inspiration for one of the friends. Okay. In the book. Okay. Um, a redhead. So, he, <laughs> so he's not hot speedo guy. Uh, no, <laughs> hot speedo guy's one of my. Favorite I haven't characters. seen Chris in a speedo, so I, I mean, it, he, I, I, I can't say. Maybe. <laughs> you gotta read a book, the book about hot speedo guy. <laughs> hot, hot speedo guy is or was real. He used to run by during night games. Yes, <laughs> I was gonna ask you. <laughs> You know, speaking of night moves, you, you implement, I'm, people outside of Santa Barbara will love the story, but I think people within Santa Barbara will really love the story because you mentioned all these places 
uh, like one of my favorites is La Tapatia and Milpa Street, this kind of hole in the wall place. You know, people know La Superica, but La Part Tapatia is like a real place. How were you able to, you know, pick the places that you did? Because they're so Santa Barbara, yet they're so individualistic on their own, right? Well, I mean, I've lived here 10 years, which helps, mm -hmm. but um, especially with regard to the restaurants that Hal is eating in, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to eat lunch on Milpas many times before the high schoolers all come running up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can you can see exactly where they tend to go, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of them are places that I enjoy. And mm -hmm. um, well, well, Santa Barbara, in your story, Santa Barbara is a character in its own right. I mean, it really sets the pace, the tone, the color. And I really loved how you were able to incorporate and give us a vision while letting us be able to explore on our own what it was like. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. That's yeah. a lovely compliment. Speaking of vision, uh, this cover is tremendous. And it, as somebody pointed out earlier, if you see the difference between the paperback and the hardcover, the paperback lettering is out front while the hardcover, the lettering is behind the book insects who did this art it's pretty amazing um this is mallory grigg who is a cover artist and um she was given an early copy of pest and very fortunately for me agreed to do the cover mm -hmm. and i believe she worked with an illustrator nicole rifkin mm -hmm. and um they sent together i think they sent eight or nine options and this one just left out it's it's, it's incredible it's one of the best covers I've seen in a while. I feel very fortunate. Yeah. But but rivaling it is this <laughs> wonderful piece. <laughs> Brian made this, correct? He did. <laughs> and you've got 10% off rodent calls. <laughs> Mayhew Pest Control. What if we really call this one? What would happen? You'd get the RNC. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> There's also a, a golf scorecard. There is. And yeah, it's very nice. But anyway, <laughs> does anybody else have any questions? Nikki. Uh, what made you, what inspired you to become a writer and how long have you been writing for? Oh, um, well, when I was about eight, a friend of my mom's moved to our little beach town from Sausalito and she rented this high rise beach condo and she had a pasta machine and a giant Gumby doll, and she was working on a romance novel. And I was like, I could live in a high-rise condo on the beach and have a giant Gumby doll and a pasta machine. I thought that seemed like really the right career choice for me. Um, instead, I went to law school, <laughs> but um, which made my mom happy. <laughs> but I, I've always loved to write, and um, I guess I started. Um, I started when I was doing uh, one of my law degrees. I was supposed to be writing a, a thesis, and I wrote a young adult novel. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any more books coming out soon? Um, yes, I have an offer, so quite possibly next summer. Any, you, do you want to expand on that? Um, yeah, well, nothing's final yet, no. but uh, it is um, either a younger and young adult novel or a higher end middle grade novel mm -hmm. about a girl whose parents moved the family to the Caribbean for a year to live on a sailboat. Wow, that's great. So I have to ask, this is very adaptable. And have you been approached to adapt? Um, the the imprint I published with Keylight, they they work hard on adaptation. And I believe they have a first look deal with someone at Sony, so mm -hmm. it could happen. I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Who would play Hal? Who would play Hal? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, when I wrote her. I actually was picturing um, a friend's daughter mm -hmm. uh, who um, we were over at their house pretty much every afternoon and I could mm -hmm. just imagine what she would grow up to be like mm -hmm. and she was much taller than 
my kids. So I, you know, imagine this just strong, powerful uh, girl mm. and who, who has been taken guff. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any comments? Okay, so yeah. Is, are there more adventures for Howl? Uh, I would, yes, I would love to write a sequel. So buy uh, lots of them and maybe I'll get two. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, go ahead. What advice would you give to any aspiring novelist in the room? Oh, well, I, I always say leave lots of nice reviews <laughs> on, on, for the books you read in case karma is real. <laughs> Well, Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming. Uh, let's sign some books. Thank you. Yay.